welcome. My name is Cindy LaQuatra, and I would like to tell you a little bit about my son, Tor LaQuatra, who is the actor, director, and producer of the film you're going to be watching. He has been fascinated with the subject you're going to be seeing for years since he's been a little boy. And he is so amazing, and he amazes me with how he's been putting everything together. He makes sure that he researches and makes sure that everything is accurate in the way of that time period. I'd like to tell you a little bit more about him though. When he was just a little boy and I saw an ad for the museum that they had a traveling exhibition in that I wanted to take him to see it because I knew he would enjoy it because that was just his thing. He wanted to learn more about the subject. So we took him and when we stepped into that museum, his eyes lit up and he was so excited to be standing right there within the history of that subject, the Titanic. So then afterwards, when we were done, he said, Mom, I'd like to go back there again. And I said, we will. We'll go another time. So when we had another chance to take him again, we did. And every time we took him, he got to learn a little bit more about the subject. I'd like to take you now on a journey into the film that you're about to see. You'll be blown away by everything that you see. And when you're done, you'll be saying, wow, he really did that? And you know what? He did. He researched, he watched films, and he knows his thing. You want to ask him a question about the subject? He'll be glad to talk to you about it. So without further ado, Hey everybody, it's a pleasure to have you here with me, as always. Again, something very special I would like to share with you now. Something that I've been keeping a little hush-hush for a very long time now. Basically, I've been doing that to keep it so surprisingly awesome and out of this world crazy so that when you do see it, you are just taken back beyond your wildest imagination. This I've shared with just a few people, those closest to me, and of course those I've had work with me and those I've engaged with and I've shared, or if a friend of mine, I've shared with them. Although now it's a big step and a very unique and very daunting forward approach to reveal it, because now I want to reveal it to everybody, and that includes you. And I hope you will be as excited as I've been each and every day I've been doing this. Since I was a young boy, since I first began to understand what the Titanic meant, what its name was, what its story was, I was taken back like that. This story is so, so gripping on human emotion bravery, self-sacrifice, the human condition. It's written all over it. This story, in my view, it has never been done in a manner to speak to those people. I remember when I saw the film from the book, A Night to Remember, and I was ecstatic because that film was really something that should be more done in our world today. That taking you in to see that moment as if you were an observer, right there witnessing it unfold right in front of your face. See, when I saw that film, I really wanted to do a type of film in that regard, something that was very in focus of the history. And 
for me, being so interested in the subject, the history, also about being a filmmaker, I actually chose to do something like this when I was in high school, although very small for my filmmaking class. But now, all these years, right after I left high school, I opened up and began doing this. And this has been, you know, endless. This has been an endless pursuit of me working tirelessly. You know, this is a, me doing an independent production here. And I've been carrying the financial woes on this thing, getting people and trying to locate the right people. And I've had a method to that madness to find who I am trying to find exactly. And right off the bat, I knew I didn't want Hollywood type actors. I wanted people, if I was looking at the photograph in the history book of that human being, of that person who was the real person, I wanted to actually find the person in real life now, present day, who really blend well to that person. And I've had such success at locating people in this regard. And some of them I ask, are you have a relative to this person? Do you like, you look just like them. So it, for me, I hope it's going to be very exciting for everybody who's eventually going to come to see the film in a finished format. You know, right now, this is, this is just a reveal. And that's all I can give you at this point in time. But I am very close to finally finishing the filming on the project. And I have a lot of busy work to still go on and do, uh, but I'm very confident that I can guarantee the product and get it out there soon after. So what I'd like to share to you, though, is a little bit more in depth on my time on this subject. Three, two, one, action. What uh, quality uh, makes Tori a good director? So he's uh, Tori. He's very personable. He's a people person. You know, he cares about others, and uh, you know, he's easy to work with. And uh, you know, he'll give you a chance to do what you want. It's not all just about him, but it's about projecting uh, the story of the film he's doing and uh also you know he's very creative and you know he's also like sort of a craftsman too because he's creative he builds these things and for the sets and also you know miniatures and it's not just the camera it's there's more behind it you know so uh his uh innovative techniques or is that what makes him stand out as being a director, or is there anything else that would be a standout? I'd definitely say that's, you know, one thing, uh, you know. And uh, his passion, too. It's not just the innovation. Uh, he clearly is into what he's doing. It's not just for the money or this or that or to look like this. He's doing it because he enjoys it, you know. With regard to the storyline, in your own words, what can you say about this documentary film centering around the actual historical events uh, while managing to center on a true life character throughout the course of the film? It's the hardest thing I've ever been in because 
my first film, I didn't have any lines to read. I didn't have to learn anything. It, I was just off to another area. But this one, mm -hmm. you got to you got to know what you were doing. Mm -hmm. um, what did you enjoy most about being on board for the making of this feature documentary? I met a lot of other great actors. Uh, Tori, as a director. Uh, in one word alone, how can you best describe Tori as an independent producer, director, storyteller, choreographer, stunt choreographer, stuntman, wardrobe head, and location director? He was amazing. He pulled this, he had this idea deep and down inside him. He kept pulling it out of himself. And when he came out, he had a vision. And he wanted everybody to share his vision. Because he knows so much about this Titanic. I mean, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. It's like he was there. Reincarnated in the sec first light. Okay, uh, what qualities make Tori a good director? He doesn't settle for a second best. He reminds me of Buddy Holly. Because Buddy Holly, he was recording in the studio. He didn't take the first take. He kept going, nope. Let's do it again. Doesn't sound good. Tori wanted, no. Let's do it another time. Huh? No. Let's do it again. He wasn't, he wanted, the more you did it, the more relaxed you were, and the more things came out. Anybody worried? It came out perfect. What makes uh, working with Tori stand out in your mind? He doesn't settle for second best. So that's a constant. Yeah, it, when you come on this project, you better be, if you don't do it right, you don't know your lines, yeah. he's going to let you know about it. And that's the director's job, keep it going line. Question, whose historical role were you portraying throughout the course of this feature documentary? Definitely the uppity bubbly known Margaret Brown. So in your role as Margaret Brown, or better known today as the unsinkable Molly Brown, did you know that uh, that term, uh, her title, Unsinkable, was never used until after she passed away in 1932? I did at not. At the age of 65. Then, uh, you know, Hollywood uh, and, and uh, news articles and uh, stories were brought out uh, uh, about this person and kind of like uh, maybe enhanced it or or took liberty uh, and called her unsinkable Molly Brown just for, I guess, uh, Hollywood aspects. So uh, kind of like how they call the Rock the Rock, right? That's that's right. Unsinkable Molly Brown. No, I I never did hear that. So today she's not really known as Margaret Brown. It's unsinkable Molly Brown. Right. So she has that uh, handle of unsinkable, even in death. As Tori, as the independent director or producer, uh, do you feel that uh, he had a, a real understanding of uh, of him portraying Molly Brown uh, as as authentic as possible? Now, getting back to uh, the director, uh, how did the director and the hairstylist create the hairstyle for you in a role of Molly Brown? Definitely brought me back in time. I mean, nobody wears those hairstyles today because who has the time? But it was definitely very awesome getting to have a hairstyle of difference. I mean, having it all perched up and it was very well done too. They definitely didn't mess it up. And as I mentioned before, like I wish my hair was a little more puffy or something. We could have maybe dangled it like how they had hers in their film. But for what we did for this one, it definitely worked out. So you feel that the hairdo you had fit the role of Molly Brown? Yes. Okay. What was one memorable moment you consider your best while working with Tori during the production of this film? One moment. Definitely just in the times, even though he said like they were all very good, he still would 
want us to do other ones to make sure we could even get the best. He was, uh, he was on the ship prior to the sailing uh, on the ill-fated uh, date of uh, April 14th, 1912. He f came with that ship uh, from Belfast to Southampton uh, as a baker. So he was hired by the White Star Line uh, as an employee. And uh, there's a lot of people on that ship, uh, you know, it had to be fed. And, and I'm sure he had a staff as well that would, uh, you know, accommodate, you know, his orders uh, to, you know, make the food for everybody on the ship. Uh, first class, second class, third, and steerage. Um, he was a baker and a chef and a cook, but he had other jobs too. Um, when the ship was uh, going down, uh, the captain uh, employed him to help out with the uh, the uh, rescuing of you know the passengers by um, helping them get into lifeboats. In fact, uh, the captain made him the commander of lifeboat number ten. So when he went to get into lifeboat number ten, found out there was two crewmen and a steward that took his place. So he felt, well, you don't need me in that lifeboat. So uh, I'll help out in another way. So he went to, uh, you know, the kitchen and he brought back loaves of bread and each uh, lifeboat had four or so uh, uh, loaves of bread that they took with them when they went uh, down into the sea from the uh, the sinking ship. And, uh, I mean, he helped, uh, you know, like I said, with uh, people getting into the ships, but he was kind of stressed out at times too. And he would sneak down uh, unbeknownst to everybody else and to try to go through the, the bowels of the ship to get to his cabin so he can have a couple swigs of whiskey, you know. So he uh, had to get his mind back to, uh, you know, reality, I guess. I don't know, by giving a couple of shots of whiskey, I guess uh, that helped him out. So he'd go back and help more people into the ships and or into the lifeboats. And of course, the, sh the ship was sinking. And so he had a grasp onto railings and stuff. So he wouldn't go flying overboard. But when it got to the point where uh, he uh, had to let go of, of the ship, of the railing, you know, uh, which was a good thing for him because he went straight down into the water and he was able to uh, hold on to a capsized lifeboat. It was a portable lifeboat, a collapsible lifeboat that they had to put together. But evidently when they put it in the water, it went upside down and they couldn't get it uh, upright. So men were clinging to this lifeboat, several people. So there was ropes hanging from it. So he, he uh, grabbed on to uh, a, a rope and held on to it for two hours. Okay, and, and until he was uh, he was picked up uh, by the Carpathia, and he was actually one of seven hundred and five survivors that was picked up and was lived to tell about it.
straight up the road like this. Just following. Yeah, and we'll pull off and we do that one time. And you come past, okay? But then we'll do another shot similar without the car, but I'll be standing over here watching you go past. And then we'll do another one like this, but I'll be standing here and you'll go past me again. Okay. Uh, then, uh, what was it? Uh, okay. Then I'll get the camera positioned in this area by the fence and watch you come again all the way down the road. Uh, a few shots here. Then we'll do the inside stuff. We should probably do the inside stuff first. Model, basic Model T is a little different than, th than regular cars. It has three pedals, but one of them isn't for the gas. There's a brake pedal, a clutch pedal, and the reverse pedal. Down here and look at that. You got your brake on your on your right, and then your reverse and your clutch. And you got a parking brake lever over here, which also doubles as a high-low lever. So when it's at half mast, you're in low gear. And you let it up all the way down to the floor and it puts it in the high gear and then you can really get moving along. And up on the up on the steering column you have your gas and your spark advance. Modern cars advance the spark automatically. This has to be told when to when to advance it to help you get up the hills.
actually did I get a few like that or <laughs> are you ready for this? I don't think I am. <laughs> <laughs> Are we up as high as we were last time? Mm hmm. I tried not going on the freaking city.
two, one, action. So when I was a kid, I was just taken back by this subject. You know, I used to, I would draw the Titanic as good as I could. And I just, I would really go in there and look at it and try to put it into the best regard as possible. Uh, I still have that drawing I did when I was a kid. And it's... You know, it's one of those things. And I wrote a little book uh, when I was in elementary school. My elementary school teacher, they put it into the library. It was like a historical first-person synopsis. The, the further I've gone into the subject, I've dove into the real people's history. You know, like learning further into their pursuits and the real-life event and who they were, who these people really were. Because ultimately, that's really what this is about. This is about those people. And my job as the filmmaker, and of course, storyteller, producer here, is to convey the story for what it is, and for not for what it's not. And I've seen it throughout the decades, numerous times, big Hollywood send-ups, Big uh, productions with, you know, endless budgets. And it just doesn't do it. Because it's, it's missing what it's about. Uh, good filmmaking conveys a message. And it's about telling a story to people who don't have a voice for that subject anymore. Or don't have the ability to talk for themselves. So, really, it, for me, it's about telling this in a way where if I could take you back to 1912, you were right there with me. And we were observing in closeness in the whole thing. You know, and of course, it's a very sad story, no doubt, but it's very important to understand in fullness what it's really about. You know, I never saw the Titanic and her day, of course, you know, it's, I saw her through events, films, books, those outlets. I've seen her through actually being able to go to the touring Titanic expedition, who, which came to Pittsburgh uh, in the Science Center when I was a little kid. And I went back a few times and it was very, it really reached across many decades, and when I was there, I, I really felt the Titanic's grasp. And even with this project I'm doing, you know, I, 
okay, I'll be out and about, and I'm looking for something maybe on the project, a little detail, a little prop or something. And it's funny because I get uh, just, I'll be looking for something, and oh, there's a book, or there's something very close in proximity. I'm thinking the Titanic is kind of presenting herself to me. Uh, she's constantly showing her notice, and I think, like, is the Titanic trying to tell me, keep going, you know? I could talk your head off about this subject. You probably wouldn't want me to do that, but, I mean, I, I know I have to cap it here, but uh, I'm very excited, and I hope you will be excited. And as I go now, uh, ultimately, what I'd like to leave you with is, please remember this. The Titanic, her people, her passengers, her, her tale is an important tale. And even though this is being done independently by my film company, Villarosa Films, uh, it is above all important to me that I strive for authenticity, accuracy, and all honest, the best research I can get my hands on and put into my material. And that's what I'm going to give and share to each and every one of you once I'm completely done. So with that, before I go, I would like to be able to say a very big shout out to every single person I've had work with me in collaboration and all cast members I've chosen for the piece. Those people presented such talent, such very unique manner in their acting capacity. And I really enjoyed my time with each of you. And you brought such uniqueness to this work. I couldn't have done that but I could bring the story and how I wanted to pursue it. So with that, again, I'm so thankful for all of you. I would love to say a true hearted goodbye until I can see you again. Until next time, goodbye.